does seem to me that since David and Jeff emphasize uh, human rights so much, and that's a part of your paper that you put to the side, it might be useful for you to make some comments about the role of human rights. That, that was a question um, for, for Professor Johnson to say something about the role of human rights. Uh, just so everybody can hear that, I don't, I don't think everybody heard that across the room. And please do try to speak up as loudly as you can. Well, I was thinking as, as uh, Gene uh, mentioned R2P that basically what I said in my presentation uh, was that uh, that the what happened with Grotius and Westphalia uh, threw the baby out with the bath. They were trying to uh, avoid the possibility of the kinds of justifications for resort to armed force that had produced the Thirty Years' War. Uh, the, and among those, especially in the first part of that 30-year uh, period, were uh, religious claims. Uh, we're right, you're wrong, you know, we have the right to use force to, to coerce you to be like us. And um, uh, it succeeded at that. Uh, the, the, this redefinition of, of, uh, of the whole idea of sovereignty, this redefinition of the right to uh, go to war uh, in that, that effectively removed the possibility of, of moral judgments, uh, succeeded in doing away with religious warfare. However, it, uh, it opened the door to some not so good things. Uh, one of the uh, uh, more immediate results was the development of the idea of liberum jus ad bellum, that is that the sovereign has the right to decide when he wants to go to war, uh, I mean the, the ruler has the right to decide when he wants to go to war to protect the sovereignty of, of uh, the society that he or she governs, uh, and to uh, and to serve it, to uh, increase its uh, uh, its domains, uh, and so on, and that uh, thank goodness eventually died away, but not until after a more more or less a century of, of the so-called sovereigns wars. So uh, then we then we end up in the 20th century with uh, with with tyrants that are uh, uh, sometimes they're kleptocrats, sometimes they are people that are uh, wantonly abusing some segment of their population because they're of a different tribe or a different ethnicity or a different religion or whatever. You know, all kinds of reasons for this. And R2P is really a res response to this. And I think it's a very good response to this. Uh, it does seem to me that, that uh, the, the international order and individual states have obligations to, or have an interest in, let me put it that way, an interest in uh, maintaining the, uh, the moral responsibility of people with the responsibility of government to serve the good of the people uh, over whom they are, are set. Uh, I, I am, in my, in my own writing, I, I have not emphasized the conception of human rights uh, enormously because I really begin at the other end of the thing. But, uh, uh, I, I would I would grant that uh, that when you when you turn the uh, the telescope around, the, uh, the the question can be put in terms of the uh, the rights of uh, groups, the rights of individuals, the rights of uh, uh, collectives that are larger than groups, and uh, and we can we can think of these in terms of universal human rights. But one thing that has always given me pause is the inability even of the people most dedicated to pushing this idea to agree on what those rights are. Uh, if you look at the, the various uh, UN-sponsored uh, human rights conferences uh, and the resolutions they have produced, sometimes the, 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 the rights that are claimed by one, uh, one set of resolution are, are in tension with or contradictory to the rights that have been uh, Proclaimed by another, and 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 uh, uh, even when you get something like uh, the uh, the U.S. Catholic bishops' uh, 1993 statement uh, uh, on uh, on the whole issue of use of armed force, uh, in their discussion of, uh, of of intervention, all they can finally agree on is that it's important to protect to intervene to protect egregious violation of basic human rights. Well, great. Uh, that's good, but where, uh, can, we, can we say what these basic human rights are? Can we say what their sources are? Can we say who really has the responsibility to protect them uh, and, what, 
uh, to what extent those uh, responsibilities extend. And I don't think that there's really anything like the kind of consensus we need to build a whole edifice of justification for use of armed force on that basis. Uh, Professor Walzer. Um, yeah, first an observation and then a question. Um, Gary Bass has written a very good book and a very big book about uh, humanitarian interventions in the 19th century, of which there were a considerable number and a great deal of argument about for and against these interventions in human rights figures Gentlemen, yes. Uh, yeah. So, first of all, on human rights, I mean, I think, Michael, you're, you're absolutely right that there, in many ways, the modern doctrine of human rights articulates or restates ideas that can be stated in other terms than human rights, probably have in the past been restated in other terms and probably in the future will be as well. I think, I think that, that's actually a source of strength rather than a problem. And just in, to, to come to kind of Jim's challenge, what's the consensus? You're absolutely right to say that there is there's no consensus on what the whole package is, and there's a great deal of dissensus around the margins. It's clear that a lot of the rights that you find within the UN Charter, for example, are largely aspirational. They're kind of things that we think would be nice to have, but they, they have a very, very different status to what I think of as the, the core element of basic negative rights. So in answer to kind of your question, where's the consensus about what are the rights that can ground intervention, I would say, well, they are, they're the core negative rights such as uh, the right to life, the right not to be, um, not to be killed or attacked, the, uh, the right to be free from rape and sexual abuse, the right to be free from torture, uh, the right to um, basic um, uh, um, uh, liberty and property security. Uh, and maybe one or two others, and you know, th there may be others that kind of fit within that, but it seems to me that we can get a really considerable amount of consensus on the fundamental importance of at least that package of, of negative rights, and that when, when those rights are uh, violated on a, on a systematic basis, that that is, that is grounds for, uh, that's certainly potentially grounds for, for, for violent, um, violent action. Uh, I mean, j just, just to come to Michael's point, does, does this, does this envisage um, different institutions to, to what we have at the moment? O almost certainly, almost certainly yes. Um, but I think th there's, you know, that, that as well can be, a, it can be a source in terms of thinking about how to develop those institutions. So to give one example, um, you know, the conference is on 10 years from 9-11. From now, you know, at that time and shortly after, many people, myself included, said, or believe that our primary response to these terrorist atrocities should have been more of a law enforcement activity than a, a, military, uh, a military response. Now, one of the problems, of course, is that our capacity for effective transnational, international policing operations to hunt down and, and bring to justice uh, um, uh, organized criminals like, like Al-Qaeda and their ilk are very, very weak. But since then, we've spent somewhere in the order of, uh, I can't remember what the figure is, but it's several trillions of dollars prosecuting these, these wars. Now, for comparison, the, inter the, the operating budget of Interpol is somewhere in the region of about 30 or 40 million dollars a year. Now, you know, what might we have we been able to achieve by diverting a small fraction of the budget we've spent 
on these military operations towards developing some kind of capacity that was perhaps regional in focus, perhaps under the mandate of NATO, but whose um, training, whose uh, weapons and operation, whose, whose ROE was some kind of a composite between that that we have for domestic police forces and those that we have as military. I don't know the answer to that question, but that seems to me to be a useful kind of practical possibility that we might, we might want to explore. Yes. Um, Michael speaks of the transformation of war into crime and police action. Um, my view is that morally it already is that. There's no transformation needed. Legally and politically, of course, uh, if we want to bring morality and law into greater congruence, then yes, we need to try to transform. <coughs> transform war into something more like a model of police action. In law, we do have these two distinct sets of norms, the norms governing police action and the norms governing war. Uh, and those norms do serve different purposes. They're quite, quite different. Um, and as of now, the norms for police action, I think, couldn't be applied to war. We have to have the norms, the legal norms governing war that we have now. But the answer to the question is yes, if we want to uh, make war legally more like police action, as I think it is in its moral nature, then we can't do that without the transformation of legal and political institutions. And I just mentioned that. Uh, I have a long paper describing such a possible institution, a, an institution that, whose task would be to try to provide reliable and authoritative guidance in discriminating just from unjust wars in order to guide the consciences of individual combatants. I have this paper forthcoming in a book dedicated to Michael Walzer. It's called, the book is called Reading Walzer. Uh, so you will right answer. Okay. <laughs> so you so you already you, you probably know, know this piece uh, anyway. But uh, that's that's my effort at one suggestion for how to try to transform institutions to make the right moral norms more directly applicable to war. And the vision of the the vision of war by reference to the kind of moral standards that David and I are, have been defending is one that is intended to provide guidance for the shaping of new institutions if anybody's willing to take it seriously. <laughs> Michael, I agree with you that the institutions, the international institutions uh, are wanting. Uh, one of the reasons that I have been very, very firmly against uh, arguments of others that, uh, that, that any resort to force ought always to have a UN mandate is that uh, A, you're, you're not going to get it in practice in times when it's absolutely necessary to get it, Kosovo, for example, uh, and B, uh, if you're thinking of, of actually having forces under UN direction, then uh, the, the history does not suggest that the prospects are very good, and if you start looking at the institutional structure of the United Nations, uh, it looks even worse because there's there's really no uh, no command and control authority. There's no uh, there's no armed force. Indeed, you depend on the individual states with their particular interests, their particular political baggage, and their uh, uh, often very differently constituted militaries to uh, to do what needs to be done. And and so, in terms of of uh, just thinking about the use of force, the uh, the international institutions are are pretty woeful. Also, I don't see how to get to better ones, uh, even, if I'm, even if I were totally convinced that it would be a good thing if we did. Uh, the, the sort of uh, proposal that, uh, that, that David makes, you know, it, it's good to have proposals like this out there. Uh, but surely there, there have been a lot of these proposals. I, I, I was thinking of, uh, of Dick Falk and Saul Mendelowitz's World Order Models Project. And, uh, you know, in the multiple thick volumes that that project produced, of how you could uh, do this and this and this.